Uh, I was thrilled when Jenny asked me to host this conversation because in the work that I do as a nutritional therapist, as a chef, I run a cooking school at the College of Naturopathic Medicine and the biggest issue that I find is connecting the dots from people who sit on our side of the fence, who have a deep understanding of what's going on in the body, who have spent that time kind of meeting people and working with people and seeing those changes in their body to connecting that to the consumer. To, you know, I don't know if anybody was in the Andy Cato, Henry Dimbleby talk talking about you know, how we make those incremental changes going to white bread. And then there was a question uh, from the audience saying, well, actually, you know, what about the bran and the wheat? And we have all of this knowledge, but really it's hard to connect it to the consumer. I think this book does this incredibly eloquently, incredibly beautifully, and it's a bit of a war cry. And so I think it's very important for everybody to think deeper about what's going on in our bodies, but also what is going on in our environment. And I would urge you, if you enjoy the conversation, please get hold of a copy because um, I read mine on the Sun Lounger, which Jenny thought was mad, um, but I enjoyed every second uh, whilst I was on holiday last week. So <laughs> um, I'm gonna get into the good stuff. Let's talk about you. So when we were, having a conversation about how this would kind of fall out, there were these beautiful six key pillars that just really naturally fell from the book. And the first one is this connection of health and the environment. And, you know, Muna has already mentioned that our environment, our elements are being polluted every single day. From water systems to air, our light, our soil, fire as well, this idea of kind of electromagnetic fields. Modern technology has given us a lot, but it's causing us a lot of problems, particularly in our bodies. Now, Jenny, there are a number of case studies in the book that are really fascinating, but I'd love you to share the case study that you feel is the most poignant. Right, okay. Um, well, let me just start by saying that most people here at Groundswell will be fully aware that we're in the midst of an environmental crisis. But what most people are not so aware of is that we are also in the midst of a health crisis, uh, that it is not normal or natural to have everybody you know going down with either cancer or an autoimmune disease or a neurodegenerative disease. It's not natural that it should be the case that more and more and more children are being diagnosed with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So these things are an epidemic and it's very hard to recognize it as such. And one of the great things I learned from the British Society of Ecological Medicine was that these epidemics are going on and that there are reasons for them in terms of our poor nutrition and in terms of our environmental toxins. And we cannot separate the decline in our wildlife from the decline in our own lives because the pollution, the factors that are causing or contributing to the decline of plants and animals and trees all over the planet are also contributing to our own decline and fall. So proper medicine is scientific medicine. It's about looking for causes and finding what you can do about them. Um, what was your question, Sam? Your favorite case study. <laughs> my favorite case study, thank you. Yeah. OK, so I think my favorite case study, which I've put in the introduction of the new book, is not the first short one. It's a second longer one. It's about a young man with MS. And the reason this is important is because it is complicated. It is a serious illness, and like most serious illnesses, is multifactorial. In other words, many contributing factors, not just one cause. It's very rarely as simple and linear as one cause. So this chap was 29, and he came to see me having just been diagnosed with MS. Now that in itself is very, very unusual because most people will go the conventional medicine route for years and years and years until they A, don't get better and B, start having side effects of the drugs and only then come to the alternatives which have a much harder struggle to succeed when it's that entrenched. He came to see me at the beginning and in taking a history, you have to find out literally what's got into someone. So first thing I asked him is how long the symptoms had been going on. They'd only been going on four months. Right? What happened four months ago? Well, 
I'm not sure, but what happened five months ago was I had to have my office sprayed for cockroaches. He worked in southern Spain. And, and these guys came along with all this protective kit and gear and serious, you know, PPE and sprayed for cockroaches. And they did tell me I shouldn't go back for about a week or 48 hours, they said, but even that's too short. Shouldn't go back into the office. But he was one of these busy, indispensable, high-powered young executive types. So we went back in within a few hours. And within a few days, he felt peculiar. And within a few months, his vision was blurred. He had appalling headaches. He was completely on the floor with exhaustion. And he was getting numb and painful patches on his hands and feet. And he went to the optician, and the optician said, oh, my goodness, you better go to a neurologist. And the neurologist did a brain scan, and the whole thing just took three or four months. You've got MS. So what we usually see is triggers rather than causes. So yes, the spraying with neurotoxic pesticides, insecticides, was indeed what had triggered this um, event. But events like that only get triggered when there's a whole lot of background predisposing factors as well. So this young man already had mercury fillings in his teeth, right? Mer mercury is part of amalgam. It's a well-known neurotoxin. Uh, check out the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. That was about mercury poisoning because hatters used it in their work and were known to go mad. Uh, he ate lots and lots of junk food, lots and lots of carbs, no good fats at all. He'd had previous insecticide exposure when he'd had his loft sprayed for wasps' nests. Um, and he didn't get enough sleep, and he, hold, he held his mobile phone to his head for his business for several hours a day. Um, so that's enough. That's enough to trigger a very serious illness. Um, now, I, I see lots of people with MS, but I rarely see them at such an early stage. So we were able to do good work. Because he was willing, and to be absolutely honest, because his wife was willing to support him, because the kind of medicine that we do in the British Society for Ecological Medicine is very challenging. It's not, here's a pill, go away. It's right. Are you prepared to sleep longer hours, stop holding your mobile phone next to your head, because as we'll hopefully see later, you are irradiating your brain. And of course, if you carry it in your pocket, you're irradiating your ovaries or testes. Um, yeah, he was willing to do that and become less indispensable. Uh, are you willing to do some organic vegetable juicing every morning? for an indefinite period, yep. Um, what about saunas and colonic hydrotherapy? And that was not immediate. We waited a year before he was even well enough to do those detox methods. Epsom salts baths he could do. Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate, goes in through the skin, supports detox, and relaxes the muscles directly. Um, what else? Glutathione is a simple three amino acid molecule that we should make for ourselves and the liver uses it for many, many detox pathways. But almost inevitably, the chemically sensitive people, the people who are being made ill by our industrial synthetic chemicals, don't make enough glutathione themselves. It's just a genetic variant. So I gave him lots of glutathione, huge amounts of vitamin C to get rid of the mercury, but that's not all you need to get rid of mercury. Um, PC, phosphatidylcholine, which is very good at getting rid of fat-soluble chemicals, and pesticides are fat-soluble. So they go in through the skin, and once in the body, they head for the fattiest organ of the body, which is the brain, right? So we actually found pesticides, insecticides, specifically in the myelin sheath surrounding his nerves, right? We found, sorry, we found it in his fat sample, and we also found it sitting on the gene which makes the protein for myelin. Now, myelin is a protein with a fatty component that surrounds the nerves and makes it possible for nerve impulses to flow. So he was losing muscle strength. He was getting numb patches on his hands and feet because nerve impulses weren't being transmitted. The myelin is like the insulation, but it's more than that. So we had two things going on. He had fat-soluble insecticides in there, and he had the same insecticide sitting on the gene whose job is to make the protein, which is part of the myelin. Now, if you have, and it was mercury, it was mercury, I'm remembering now, on the gene that was meant to make the myelin. If you have uh, mercury mixed in with a protein, it distorts the structure. The white blood cells of the immune system, which are always on patrol, 
are looking out for anything that looks abnormal. So an alien protein, they think, indicates a cancer cell or a bacterium. So they're going to zap it. They're going to destroy it. And this is one of the ways in which heavy metal toxicity and other toxicity from the environment is causing our epidemic of autoimmune disease. Right? So MS is neurodegenerative, but it's also autoimmune. So how do you get that mercury off? How do you get the pesticides off? Um, mercury, everything I've already described, plus saunas, plus vitamin C, plus zinc, selenium, sulfur-containing vegetables, that's onions, garlic, and leeks, and so on, um, curcumin, which is turmeric, and coriander, and chlorella, but these have to be produced organically. It's one of the ways in which coriander can detox mercury is because, precisely because it's so very good at picking it up. Picks it up in the body and takes it out, but it will equally pick it up from the soil if it's grown in soil that's been contaminated with heavy metals. So, you know, it's got to be organic. So we did all this. His wife was very supportive and... He was, within a few weeks, he said his brain was functioning more clearly. And this is what I've noticed. Brain fog clears before the physical energy comes back. So he got his brain back, then he got his energy back. And within a few months, when we measured the levels of the pesticides, they'd gone right down. Uh, his energy came back, his vision improved. Within four or five months, his vision was back to normal. And the optician was thrilled, but deeply puzzled. Now, at this point, the neurologist and the optician should have got out their notebook or dropped me an email and said, wow, how did you do this? Because this could assist other people. We want to learn. But that's not how it happens in conventional medicine, uh, clearly not in conventional optometry either. Now, one of the golden rules of this kind of approach, and I think it probably applies also if you're transitioning to organic farming, is put the good stuff in before you take the bad stuff out. So he still had mercury fillings in his teeth. So only when I had got all his nutrients to tip-top levels and got him on the good organic vegetable juicing program did we then send him to a specialist dentist who could remove and replace these toxic metal fillings with safe ones. Not your high street dentist. It has to be a specialist dentist who belongs to the International Academy for Oral Medicine and Toxicology or the British Society for Mercury-Free Dentistry. All, these, all this information is, is in the book. So he got better. I also had to take him off all his refined carbs and sugar, which he found very, very hard. People find it easier to put the good, good stuff in than to take the junk food out, because the junk food is addictive, and it's designed to be addictive. It's very profitable. And he periodically relapses and has a donut binge. And then what happens is... He gets all his old symptoms back, the blurred vision and the pain and numbness in the hands and feet and the exhaustion. And he also gets symptoms he didn't have before, like chest pain. Within a couple of weeks of getting back off the junk food and back on the regime, he gets better again. Now, these lapses are inevitable. We're only human, but they're also useful because he's lapsed four or five times and now he absolutely knows that this program works. And yeah, he has to be pretty strict forever and ever. The details of the dietary changes are, are in the case history in the book. But it's an example of how complicated it can be and how, you know, to quote the late lamented, lovely Dr. Michael Mosley, it's not just one thing. It's many different things, which means it's hard work for the physician or the nutritional therapist and for the patient. Thank it you. took a long time to acquire all those toxins. It'll take a long time to get them out. Sorry, cutting in there. But um, you make some beautiful points in there, and there's a couple of things that I really want to pick up on. This idea and, you know, things like MS, type 2 diabetes, cancer, these are not uncommon anymore. And you make a point in the book that we are not living longer, we're actually living sicker. I think that's really interesting and a really interesting terminology in the way we think about how our health and how our world has progressed. But these epidemic levels of illness that we're seeing are just kind of the new normal, right? We all know somebody that's not very well, that's maybe taking a few medications and it's not something that where we are concerned, but not the way we would have been 50 years, 100 years ago where these things were much rarer. 
why do you think we've accepted the, this level yeah. of illness? We've accepted this level of sickness because fundamentally we haven't noticed. And it's the same in ecology. Isabella Tree in her book Wilding uh, calls it, it's not her phrase, but it's from her that I learnt it, um, shifting baseline syndrome. So if you think about the disappearance of, say, birds, if you're an ornithologist and you're surveying a patch of land and you are 40 years old, you will say, you know, the bird numbers here have declined from, I don't know, 100 different species to only 40 different species. But if you were 200 years old, you'd know that they'd actually declined from a 1,000 different species. So we can only remember back to the beginning of our own lifetimes. So it's actually the older people among us who know that when we were growing up, we didn't have many relatives who got cancer. We didn't have many relatives with osteoporosis or um, diabetes. I mean, diabetes type 2, by the way, used to be called mature onset diabetes because it only happened in old, older people. There are kids with it in Bradford. Uh, and there are kids with Alzheimer's in the most polluted cities of the world, like um, Santiago and Mexico City. And there were in Paris before they brought in some of the changes to reduce their air pollution. So you don't see it because it's become normal and we have become numb to it. Um, and also because we've been given a false story of why it is the case. Right? Epidemiologists are starting to acknowledge that there are epidemic levels of these illnesses. It's starting to be talked about in the mainstream media. But we are told it's because we have an aging population which is really a way of saying, thanks to the wonders of modern medicine, we've been enabled to live long enough to get all these terrible, hideous diseases. No, it's a lie for two reasons. Firstly, if the increase, say, in cancer was about aging, then why is cancer rising fastest among children? Because it is. When I graduated in 1982, there was no such thing as a children's hospice. It didn't exist anywhere in the world. That's the year the first one was built because tragically it was and is necessary. Right? Kids are dying of leukemia around nuclear power stations and this was well known in the 70s and 80s, by the way. It's been forgotten. And all the chemical pollution that we're producing is making the kids sicker and the younger they are, the faster their rate of cancer and other serious diseases is increasing. That's one reason why it's not aging. And the other reason why it's nothing to do with aging is an arithmetical glitch, right? We are told over and over again that on average we now live into our 80s, whereas in, let's say, Charles Dickens's time, the mid-1800s, the average age of death was 45. Hang on there. The average age of death was 45, but that's because it includes the 25% of people who died before they reached their fifth birthday. Right. Now, they died of infectious diseases that had devastating effects because they lived in poverty and crowded housing and there was no hygiene or sanitation. Now we've got too much hygiene sanitation, but it was the other way around in the mid-19th century. So if you take those kids out of the equation, they lived to exactly the same age we do. And again, if you read Dickens, plenty of compost mentis people in their 80s and 90s that's how the institution of the workhouse was even possible. Because those people were able to work six, seven days a week, which was awful, of course. But the point is, yeah, we're not living longer. We are living the last decade of our life turning into this hideous twilight of decline and disability. And it doesn't need to be that way. It isn't normal or natural or inevitable. And that's why I've written the book about the causes. Thank you. Whew. Little bit of a step change. I'm going to take us up a level, keep it light. Um, you state in the book that what farmers do, I predict, will affect our health more profoundly than anything that doctors do. So in your opinion, what should be farmers' top priority to support our health? Okay. Well, I did talk about this morning, and I don't want to preach to farmers because I'm not a farmer and because I know that those of you who are farmers are under immense economic pressure and the government is failing to support you into transitioning into more regenerative and 
ultimately, I would hope, organic ways of farming. But put simply, the pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides have all been linked with these very serious neurodegenerative diseases, with cancer, and with serious endocrine disruption. And that includes cancers as a reproductive tract. I saw a little boy a couple of years ago with man boobs, and the GP had said to his mum, oh, oh, don't worry, uh, the man boobs are quite common among the young boys these days. Again, shifting baseline, yeah, they are, but they're an example of these very chemicals that are in the soil causing endocrine disruption. However, let's take the pressure off farmers a bit. Those are not the only sources of toxic chemicals, right? Um, plastic, right, that's not coming from farming. That's coming from all the millions of plastic water bottles, plastic wrap, plastic containers. Um, in chapter three, which is actually about water pollution, I go through a long list of all the things we're using plastic for and a long list of all the safer substances we could use instead of plastic, right? Um, I've got my sandwich in a paper bag, right? You don't have to wrap food in plastic. But what's happening is plastic doesn't biodegrade. Right, if you put a cabbage leaf on the compost heap, the bacteria turn it into something else altogether. That's biodegradation. Plastic physically breaks down into smaller and smaller particles, but they are just nanoparticles of plastic. And just as bad as the pesticides, they are endocrine disruptors. They mess with our hormones. What plastics and pesticides do is to sit on hormone receptors, specifically estrogen receptors on the surfaces of all our body's cells, men as well as women, and they trigger an excessive estrogenic response. That's why you see men with man boobs, and that's why you see so many women with breast cancer. Anybody put their hand up who doesn't know a woman who's had breast cancer? Yeah, exactly. 50 years ago, it was rare. Um, so, yeah, plastics are a problem as well. But the thing is, knowledge is power. And if we know what we're surrounded by... Chlorine in the water, in some parts of the country, fluoride in the water, plastics, forever chemicals like the ones in the film, dark waters. Uh, if we know all this, we can do something about it because every single one of these substances can be ditched and or replaced by something harmless. Um, and that's, that's in every chapter of the book, but it's also particularly in the resources section at the end. We don't have to keep being poisoned. Most of this is within our power to change. The bit that's least within our power is air pollution in the outdoors, right? traffic fumes, outdoor air pollution. You know, if you can't afford to move away from the main road, you are being subjected to really dangerous levels of petrochemical, burnt petrochemical fumes. But most people who are not farmers spend 90% of their lives indoors. And we can control the environment in our homes, the air pollution indoors. We can stop spraying air freshener around. It's full of plastic nanoparticles and many other toxins that are carcinogenic. The easiest p patient I ever saw was someone whose migraines I stopped just by telling them to stop spraying the air freshener around. Usually it's much more complicated. So if your house is smelly, empty the bins and open the windows. If you still want a really nice smell, um, get a beeswax candle and a ceramic burner and burn essential oils, which is what perfume was until 150 years ago. Perfume was simply essential oils physically extracted from flowers. Lavender, lemongrass, jasmine, geranium, rose, orange flower. These are wonderful smells. And you can use them instead of perfume on your body and on your clothes as well. And one patient said to me, yeah, but Dr. Goodman, they smell lovely, but they don't last all day. Now, they don't because your body knows how to biodegrade them. So put some more on. Look, it's a boiling hot day. We're all hot and sweaty. Deodorants are full of aluminium. They're full of parabens. Uh, aluminium's implicated in breast cancer and in Alzheimer's disease. Parabens is carcinogenic as well. We've got to reacclimatize to the smell of fresh, healthy human sweat. The solution is to wash. There are alternative deodorants, but again, they don't last all day. So it's about sorting out our priorities, looking in the cupboard under the kitchen sink at all those disinfectants and cleaning chemicals. If you look closely, you'll see many of them have the skull and crossbones on. It still means what you think it means. And look in your bathroom cabinets at all the 
moisturizer, perfume, deodorants, da 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 da. There are alternatives to all of them. And I have listed the ones that are certified by the Soil Association and Cosmos, which is Safe Cosmetics, who the Soil Association have partnered with. I had long and fruitful conversations with the Soil Association. Every toxic chemical in your bathroom and kitchen has a safe alternative, and some of them can be thrown out already. Um, so, yeah, if we know what's in it, we can avoid it. And if you're going shopping, I mean, I would hope that you're not eating any food that comes with an ingredients list at all. But if you are, take your magnifying glass to the shop, check the ingredients list, take your magnifying glass to the chemist. Don't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't feel safe to put in your mouth because the skin is a huge absorptive surface and all these fat-soluble petrochemicals go right in. And sadly, even in the health food shop, you need your magnifying glass. Because what I learned from the Soil Association is that with food, there is some regulation. You can't call it organic if it isn't. But with perfumes and these so-called beauty products, you can. If it's only 1% organic, you can label it organic, which is why you have to look out for Cosmos or the Soil Association with these products in your bathroom. And with clothing, you need to look out for the GOTS, uh, Global Organic Textile Standards, because um, I only realized in the course of writing the book, we don't only absorb toxic chemicals from the environment from what we're rubbing into our skin, but what we're wearing. And, you know, don't beat yourself up about this. It takes a couple of years to make this change over. But if your bed linen or your clothing is cotton that's been drenched in pesticides, you may be absorbing them through your skin. Now, Pesticide Action Network's main concern about this is the the risk to the health of the cotton farmers and their children who, when they're not doing it organically, get very, very ill. And Pesticide Action Network are helping lots of farmers in Africa to grow their cotton organically. And actually, it uses less water. So it's doubly better for the environment as well as for the workers and the wearers. But most of our clothes now are synthetic. And nylon and rayon and polyester, these are all petrochemical products. They're essentially plastics. And when we wear them, that's affecting us. When we wash them, zillions of nanoparticles are going into the water, into the earth, back into us. They come back to bite us. Into the animals, in the ocean, into the fish, into the birds. And when we finished wearing them and we take them to the charity shop with the best will in the world, and actually they dis I discovered they get dumped in Africa where they undermine the local textile industry. And wherever they're dumped, that's plastic pollution in our soil, in our water, in our air. So you can't change over all at once when you discover about the clothing. But as Amelia Twine of Sustainable Fashion Week says, the most sustainable garment you possess is the one that's already in your wardrobe. So reuse, repair, learn to sew. If you can't sew, find someone who can sell them on, turn them into something else but minimize the throwing away of synthetic clothing because it does come back to bite us. And again, Amelia Twine says that there are now enough garments on the planet to clothe the next six generations. So fast fashion is part of what's poisoning us as well as the food and pharmaceutical and petrochemical industries generally. Um, and once we know about it, we can change course and as William Lana of Green Fibers, a little organic cotton clothing and bedding company in Totnes said, what we buy will be produced, what we don't won't. So yes, we're up against the power of these huge multinational corporations, but they can only stay rich and powerful if we, the consumers, remain their customers. So if we support all the alternatives that I've listed in the book and stop buying, you know, the plastic bags and the junk deodorants and the junk food, um, we will bring about a transformation in our own health and that of the planet. I think, oh, yes. I've only got time for one more, but what's great is Jenny's covered off about three of my other questions. So I'll save you that. Though I really wanted to ask a question on organic, but I actually feel that this last question is probably a little bit more poignant um, we talk about the environment now as an inanimate object. We've completely disconnected from it. 
maybe not in this tent, maybe not in this field, but in general, people don't see it as a living, breathing organism. And perhaps we've even disconnected from its identity. You know, this idea of Mother Earth um, might be a little bit woo-woo for some of you, but uh, any of you that work the soil will understand that, you know, it has a character. We can change what's going on there. Um, how do you think we reframe our relationship with the earth and soil in order to help heal it? Well, I'll be unashamedly woo-woo because um, if we try and separate ourselves from our mother, the earth, we get the mess that we're in now, you know. It goes back to Descartes. We all know how it, how it happened. Um, it's seeing the environment as an it, as an other, as a source, a resource from which we extract what we need. And we are integral to the web of life. You know, we're animals and we're dependent on plants just like other animals are and they're dependent on the soil and the rain. And I think everybody here knows this, that we're all part of it. But I think changing the language can help. Um, Graham Tudge uses the phrase biosphere rather than environment. And, and I like that too. It's not an it and we're not in it. We're of it. We are inextricably part of it. And it's the, the extractive mentality, the mentality of separation that's led actually to medical science adopting this very mechanistic approach. Uh, the body is an object, where do we need to fix it rather than how's it got out of harmony with the earth of which it's a part? Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, I'm gonna hand over to you guys. I think we've got time probably for two questions. It's 20 to 8. I've talked too long, sorry. <laughs> I want everybody to have time if you are going to um, buy the book. Jenny's going to sign them at the end, so I want there to be enough time for that. But if you have a question, there is a lovely man in a hat. I need you to just move a little bit further forwards just to where the light line is. Otherwise, the tech will disintegrate. Literally. Thank you. <laughs> and then there's a second question in the front row as well, so I'll take this one and then this one here. So we've got three. Perfect. Um, over to you. Well, um, that was just, that blew me away, just hearing all of that. I'd love to hook you up with my parents. <laughs> um, my parents, I guess, represent um, this, the, I guess my question is building on the last thing that you just said, which is <clears throat> the story, changing the story in, in the quote unquote mainstream, um, the language, um, yeah, what well, I mean, you you've been working at this for a long time. Like, what do you see is kind of needed in the in the coming years to kind of that that we can all take away potentially to kind of yeah, yeah bring. I bring think about it's that. it's incremental. I mean, in the chapters in the book, Earth, Water, Air, Fire, and a tour of your house, indoor pollution. In each one, I list lots and lots of changes people can make, like eating organic, like filtering their water, like reducing their interaction with their mobile phone like going through their bathroom cabinets and kitchen cupboards with a fine tooth comb. But I do say, I think in the intro and in the conclusion, please don't be overwhelmed. Don't try and make all these changes at once because nobody can. Give yourself a year or two, read it slowly. Any change you make will make a difference. If you can only afford one organic meal a week, it's already making a difference to you and to the planet. So take it slowly because to be honest, most of us can't cope with the big picture all at once. It is overwhelming, and it's more overwhelming than I've said because I also discuss the hazards of nuclear radiation and the hazards of the electromagnetic radiation that's coming out of your mobile phone. And that's not a way to get popular. Um, <laughs> with, with, with big tech or with anybody else, I'm probably the only person in this tent and in this field who doesn't own a smartphone. Um, but there are plenty of ways to stay in touch with everyone and use the internet and broadband and blah, blah, blah. Plenty of ways we can use that technology safely. Um, but actually the big tech industry have taken a leaf out of Big Tobacco's playbook. They're using all the same tricks. They're hiring highly bought scientists to produce papers showing there's no link with, between electro, uh, brain tumors and mobile phone use. But I have found thousands of studies showing that there is a link. These truths are incredibly inconvenient. So in terms of how we get the word out there, incrementally, slowly, gradually, and by example. Okay, right. Question two over here. Do you want to just say? To you need the mic, or people can't hear you. Sorry, I sorry about that. Uh, I think I was going to uh, ask the, uh, the mobile phone question. 
you know, okay, we're all kind of addicted to our phones. And I know the answer probably is leave it at home. But, you know, what's the... <laughs> You know, what's the safest way to keep it close yeah, to you? There are loads or of ways. Or is there of, any safe yeah. way? There are loads and loads of ways of making it safe. You can put it in a little Faraday bag when you're not using it or other protective device so it's no longer irradi irradiating you. You can put it on flight mode. You can put it not in your pocket but in a bag you carry at a distance from your body. You can use always speakerphone. You can text rather than talk. And there's loads and loads of companies now, mostly run by physicists who have become electrosensitive themselves, providing um, meters so you can measure how much risk there is in your home and loads of ways of making it safe. We don't have to give it up. We have to be aware of it. The big tech companies could have used much safer frequencies, but they've chosen not to. Um, and the way to be back in touch with the electromagnetic field of our Earth that we evolved with over millions of years is simply to stand barefoot on the grass. Yeah. And, and you could all take your shoes off now <coughs> and do that for the last question if um, you're not already. Th thank you for that answer. Thank you. Um, last question. No? Okay, is there any last questions that aren't mobile phone related? I'm gonna take this one over here. Thank you, and then that is the last one. And then there will be signings of books. I just wondered about sun safety and sun cream without putting chemicals on your yeah. skin. That's, that's in my first book, Staying Alive in Toxic Times, in chapter three, which is summer, because it goes um, winter, spring, summer, autumn. Um, Short answer is a lot of dermatologists are starting to think the sunscreen is much more carcinogenic than the sun. And as my colleague, Dr. Sarah Myhill says, we evolved running naked under the African sun. The sun is absolutely essential for vitamin D, which is the most powerful anti-cancer medicine on the planet. However, you can burn. Burning is not a good idea. Burning is a risk, tanning isn't. So tan slowly. There are some safe sunscreens, ones made by uh, Badger, ones made by B something, I've listed them in the book. But the thing about this kind of information is it keeps changing because a lovely benevolent herbal company can get taken over by big pharmaceutical firms and then suddenly the ingredients list looks rather different. But there are safe sunscreens, but the best safe sunscreen is clothing and gradually increasing your exposure. You know, if you've been living indoors in the UK, for 11 months and you go and lie on a beach in the Mediterranean in August in a bikini, you're gonna burn, that's daft. But if you build up your tan very gradually, you get all the benefits of sunshine without the dangers. Yes, ultraviolet on its own is a risk, but the sun gives it to us along with infrared, which is healing and protective. So yeah, the whole package. I'm very, very happy to sign books, but I should warn you, although I have jettisoned many aspects of conventional medicine, Sadly, I have retained doctor's handwriting. So I hope the signature will be legible. I'll do my best. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was amazing. I could sit in this tent all night, but I know that we're not allowed to. So um, I think books will be over at the back with Muna and Rosie uh, next to the drinks. Um, yeah, please come and continue the conversation and thank you for attending. <laughs>